Puss in Boots. Once upon a time there lived a poor miller who had three sons. When he died, all he owned was divided between his sons. The eldest had the mill, the second son had the donkey and cart, and all that was left for the youngest son was the miller's black cat. The boy was very fond of the cat, but could not see how she would ever make his fortune. As he stroked her gently, she said, Don't worry, master. If you do what I tell you, you will see what I can do for you. First, get me a large bag and a pair of boots. The miller's son took the last few shillings he had and bought the cat a large bag and a pair of yellow boots. The cat put on her new boots and went out into the garden. She picked some lettuce and put it in the new bag. Then off she went across the fields until she found a rabbit hole. She put the bag down with its mouth wide open so the lettuce could be seen. Then she hid herself behind a low hedge. Soon a fat gray rabbit popped his head out of the hole. He smelled the fresh lettuce and jumped into the bag to eat it. Puss and Boots leapt from behind the hedge and swiftly drew the strings of the bag together and the fat rabbit was caught. Then Puss slung the bag over her shoulder and set off in her yellow boots until she came to the king's palace. She presented herself to the king, bowing low, and said, Your Majesty, I have brought you a fat rabbit from the estate of my master, the Marquis of Carabas. The king was amused at the sight of a black cat in yellow boots, but he graciously accepted the gift. The next day, Puss put a handful of grain in her bag and went out to the fields. She set the bag as before and lay down beside it, pretending to be dead. This time, two pheasants came and started to eat the grain. She waited for the right moment and quickly gathered up the strings of the bag, catching both birds inside. Once more, she set off for the palace and presented herself to the king. My master, the Marquis of Carabas, sends you, or begs your acceptance of these two pheasants, said Puss in Boots, bowing gracefully. Tell your master, said the king, that I am pleased to accept his gift. <coughs> he must have a very fine estate. Oh, indeed, it is very fine, said Puss, as she bowed and took her leave of the king. As she passed through the great halls, she heard that the king and his daughter were going to drive beside the river that afternoon. Puss raced home to her master and told him about her visit to the palace, and then commanded him, I want you to go and swim in the river, and if anyone asks your name, you are to say that you are the Marquis of Carabas. So he left Puss in Boots to guard his clothes and went and swam in the river. Puss carefully hid the clothes under a pile of stones and waited for the royal carriage. As it approached, Puss ran out, shouting, Help! Help! The Marquis of Carabas is falling, is drowning! The king ordered the coach to stop and sent his servants to rescue the Marquis. When Puss went up to the carriage, with his hat in his hand, bowed to the king, the princess, and said, We are indeed so grateful that you happen to be passing just now, but alas, a thief has stolen my master's clothes. The king sent a servant to the palace to get a suit, and when the miller's son put it on, he looked just like a prince. This is my master, the Marquis of Carabas, said Puss to the king and princess as she graciously introduced him. We hope you will drive on and dine with the Marquis. It will be a pleasure, replied the king, and he invited the Marquis to ride in his carriage. Puss ran ahead of the carriage and took a shortcut across the fields. Back on the road, she came across some haymakers. They stared at the sight of a cat in yellow boots, and she told them sternly, When the king passes this way and asks to whom this field of hay belongs, you are to say to the Marquis of Carabas, your majesty. Then she ran on until she came to a field where reapers were busy cutting the wheat. When the king passes this way, said Puss, and asks to whom this field of wheat belongs, you are to say to the Marquis of Carabas, your majesty. Now the land really belonged to a terrible ogre, and Puss in Boots carried on running until she reached his great castle. No one ever visited him because he was so frightening. But when he opened the door, Puss walked right in, showing off her fine boots. The ogre was so shocked that he could only stare at her. 
I have heard that you can turn yourself into a wild beast. Is that true? said Puss calmly. Well, naturally, said the ogre, swelling with pride. And then in a flash, he became a roaring lion. Poor Puss ran and hid herself up the chimney. The ogre changed himself back again and laughed at Puss, who said, It is truly wonderful that an ogre such as yourself can become a great lion, but I very much doubt that you could change into a tiny creature, say, a mouse. Pooh! No problem at all, said the ogre. And in an instant, he had disappeared and Puss saw a tiny mouse running across the room. She pounced and seized the creature, and with one shake, the ogre was gone forever. At this moment, the king's carriage drew up outside the castle. You have a splendid estate, said the king to the miller's son. For sure enough, the haymakers and reapers had obeyed Puss and told him that the land belonged to the Marquis of Carabas. And this is a magnificent castle. They went inside and sat down to a feast. This young man would make a good husband for my daughter, thought the king. Your title does not match your wealth. I shall make you a prince. The princess loved the prince, and he loved her. So they were married and lived happily together, happily in the ogre's castle. Puss in Boots lived in comfort to the end of her life, and she never had to hunt again. And that is the end.